Hi everyone, I'm going to read uh, the first story of chapter one from this compilation of Hemingway stories called In Our Time. It's called the Indian Camp. There's a, there's a racial slur that occurs in, in some of the dialogue in the story and I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going to pause when I get to that point and not, and not, and not speak it um, and then just pick up the story immediately afterwards. Um, I, I read this story with, with teachers sometimes, and it concerns a young, a young white boy, that, the son of a doctor, and it concerns a young Native American child that is born during the course of the story. And I ask us to consider what each child might need from us as educators, were they to be in our classrooms individually or, or perhaps together. And I ask what, what our society needs each child to, to learn from us as, as educators. Because the society in this story and the society today is divided in very similar ways. Indeed, the one gave birth to the other. This takes place about the turn of the 20th century in Upper Michigan um, on what still seems from the story like a kind of frontier between um, Anglo-America and it's engaged in its westward expansion and um, and Native Americans who are being pushed westward and exterminated, m many of them along the way. Um, so I ask us to think about what does it mean to have, um, have children from very different backgrounds in our classrooms and what does the society need them to learn and acquire during their time with us to help make the society more healthy. Indian Camp. At the lake shore, there was another rowboat drawn up. The two Indians stood waiting. Nick and his father got in the stern of the boat, and the Indians shoved it off, and one of them got into row. Uncle George sat in the stern of the camp rowboat. The young Indian shoved the camp boat off and got into row, Uncle George. The two boats started off in the dark. Nick heard the oar locks of the other boat quite a ways ahead of them in the mist. The Indians rowed with quick, choppy strokes. Nick lay back with his father's arm around him. It was cold on the water. The Indian who was rowing them was working very hard, but the other boat moved further ahead in the mist all the time. Where are we going, Dad? Nick asked. Over to the Indian camp. There's an Indian lady very sick. Oh, said Nick. Across the bay, they found the other boat beached. Uncle George was smoking a cigar in the dark. The young Indian pulled the boat way up the beach. Uncle George gave both Indians cigars. They walked up from the beach through a meadow that was soaking wet with dew, following the young Indian who carried a lantern. Then they went into the woods and followed a trail that led to the logging road that ran back into the hills. It was much lighter on the logging road as the timber was cut away on both sides. The young Indian stopped and blew out his lantern and they all walked along the road. They came around a bend and a dog came out barking. Ahead were the lights of the shanties where the Indian bark peelers lived. More dogs rushed out at them. The two Indians sent them back to the shanties. In the shanty nearest the road, there was a light in the window. An old woman stood in the doorway holding a lamp. Inside, on a wooden bunk, lay a young Indian woman. She had been trying to have her baby for two days. All the old women in the camp had been helping her. The men had moved off up the road to sit in the dark and smoke out of range of the noise she made. She screamed just as Nick and the two Indians followed his father and Uncle George into the shanty. She lay in the lower bunk, very big, under a quilt. Her head was turned to one side. In the upper bunk was her husband. He had cut his foot very badly with an ax three days before. He was smoking a pipe. The room smelled very bad. Nick's father ordered some water to be put on the stove, and while it was heating, he spoke to Nick. This lady's going to have a baby, Nick, he said. I know. You don't know, said his father. Listen to me. What she's going through is called being in labor. The baby wants to be born, and she wants it to be born. All her muscles are trying to get the baby born. That is what's happening when she screams. I see, Nick said. Just then the woman cried out. Oh, Dad, can't you give her something to make her stop screaming? Nick asked. No, I haven't any anesthetic, his father said. But her screams are not important. I don't hear them because they're not important. The husband in the upper bunk rolled over against the wall. 
The woman in the kitchen motioned to the doctor that the water was hot. Nick's father went into the kitchen and poured about half the water out of the big kettle into a basin. Into the water left in the kettle, he put several things he unwrapped from a handkerchief. Those must boil, he said, and began to scrub his hands in the basin of hot water with a cake of soap he had brought from the camp. Nick watched his father's hands scrubbing each other with the soap. While his father washed his hands very carefully and thoroughly, he talked. You see, Nick, babies are supposed to be born head first, but sometimes they're not. When they're not, they make a lot of trouble for everybody. Maybe I'll have to operate on this lady. We'll know in a little while. When he was satisfied with his hands, he went in and went to work. Pull back that quilt, will you, George? He said, I'd rather not touch it. Later, when he started to operate, Uncle George and the three Indian men held the woman still. She bit Uncle George on the arm, and Uncle George said, he cursed, and the young woman, the young Indian, who had rowed Uncle George over, laughed at him. Nick held the basin for his father. It all took a long time. His father picked the baby up and slapped it to make it breathe and handed it to the old woman. See, it's a boy, Nick, he said. How do you like being an intern? Nick said, all right. He was looking away so as not to see what his father was doing. There, that gets it, said his father, and he put something into the basin. Nick didn't look at it. Now, his father said, there's some stitches to put in. You can watch this or not, Nick, just as you like. I'm gonna sew up the incision I made. Nick did not watch. His curiosity had been gone for a long time. His father finished and stood up. Uncle George and the three Indian men stood up. Nick put the basin out in the kitchen. Uncle George looked at his arm. The young Indian smiled reminiscently. I'd put some peroxide on that, George, the doctor said. He bent over the Indian woman. She was quiet now and her eyes were closed. She looked very pale. She did not know what had become of the baby or anything. I'll be back in the morning, the doctor said, standing up. The nurse should be here from St. Ignace by noon and she'll bring everything we need. He was feeling exalted and talkative as football players are in the, in the dressing room after a game. That's one for the medical journal, George, he said, doing a cesarean with a jackknife, sewing it up with nine-foot tapered gut leaders. Uncle George was standing against the wall looking at his arm. Oh, you're a great man, all right, he said. Ought to have a look at the proud father. They're usually the worst sufferers in these little affairs, the doctor said. I must say he took it all pretty quietly. He pulled back the blanket from the Indian's head. His hand came away wet. He mounted on the edge of the lower bunk with the lamp in one hand and looked in. The Indian lay with his face toward the wall. His throat had been cut from ear to ear. The blood had flowed down into a pool where his body sagged in the bunk. His head raised on his left arm. The open razor lay edge up in the blankets. Take Nick out of the shanty, George, the doctor said. There was no need of that. Nick Standing in the door of the kitchen had a good view of the upper bunk when his father, the lamp in one hand, tipped the Indian's head back. It was just beginning to be daylight when they walked along the logging road back toward the lake. I'm terribly sorry I brought you along, Nicky, said his father, all his post-operative exhilaration gone. That was an awful mess to put you through. Do ladies always have such a hard time having babies? Nick asked. No. That was very, very exceptional. Why did he kill himself, Daddy? I don't know, Nick. He couldn't stand things, I guess. Do many men kill themselves, Daddy? Not very many, Nick. Do many women? Hardly ever. Don't they ever? Oh, yes, they do sometimes. Daddy? Yes. Where'd Uncle George go? He'll turn up, all right. Is dying hard, Daddy? No. <laughs> I think it's pretty easy, Nick. It all depends. They were seated in the boat, Nick in the stern, his father rowing. The sun was coming up over the hills. A bass jumped, making a circle in the water. Nick trailed his hand in the water. It felt warm in the sharp chill of the morning. In the early morning on the lake, sitting in the stern of the boat with his father rowing, he felt quite sure that he would never die. <laughs>